evening, everyone. Thank you so much for once again being a part of our midweek Bible study. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come into your home and into your life tonight. We've been studying the Exodus, the call of the wild, as God's people ventured from wilderness to captivity and then back to the wilderness before finally setting in the land of Canaan. We see this unique story and how it unfolds to teach us God's word, God's will, to show us God's providence, and at the end of the day, declare boldly that God is sovereign above every leader, ruler, and power this world offers. Tonight we're in Exodus chapter 3, and as we look at this chapter, we see a very familiar story. The story of Moses, a man who was unprepared for what was about to happen. The burning bush and the call God gave him to go and to lead his people to freedom. One of the things that I have discovered in my study of the Exodus is that God's not always just powerful in the big booming moments. Sometimes his power is found in the quiet still moments when it's just one person or one group or one family alone with God in a moment of clarity, a moment of direction and guidance and wisdom, in a moment where God boldly declares, I have chosen you. There's a job at hand. You're not the only one who can do it, but you're the one I've picked. Today I want you to know, and I, I want you to be able to say with confidence that you know God has something for you, some kind of a work or a plan. Oh, uh, a path, a journey. I don't know how you define it. That doesn't matter to me. I just want you to know that God has purpose for you. And I don't believe your purpose will be to lead his people out of captivity. To stand on a great pedestal or a stage in front of the world's leaders and boldly declare, this is who God is. I don't know and I don't believe that that will be what you and I have to do. But we still have purpose. Because God has ordained our days and put them before us as an opportunity to serve him. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like you to get your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 3. We probably won't read all of it tonight, but we'll read most of the chapter. And as we read it, I want you to see that there's movements even in this quiet moment. That there are stages to the conversation God has with Moses. There are some concerns that our hero declares to God in a, in a thing that almost befuddles me. And there is a moment when God's will and Moses' will unite. So here's what I want you to do. Have Exodus 3 ready. Let's read right now the first six verses. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So Moses looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will turn now aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses, Moses said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take the sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, the Lord said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. I find it fascinating that the story is so very matter-of-fact, that it just presents these not outlandish, but let's be honest, outstanding and out of the normal and ordinary events as something that just occurred. There's no buildup or explanation to it. There's just Moses, a man who was doing the job of a shepherd, and God at the same place, in the same time. Moses was, I think, curious confused, and I think he was concerned. 
After all, have you ever seen a fire that didn't consume? And as he approached it, I I'm fascinated that his curiosity, that it kept bringing him near God, not away from God. So many times we meet people who, as they study the world, science, the things around us, that they seem to use that as a stepping stone away from God. Yet here Moses looks at this extraordinary event, one he can't explain, and he draws close. He investigates. And when God notices that Moses is investigating, God says, Moses, Moses, stop, for you're on holy ground. Now, is there anything holy about that ground? Not really. In fact, you can go to the Sinai Peninsula today and you can stand in the shadow of what we historically believe to be Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, the same name, the same place. There's nothing special about it. So what made it holy ground? I think you probably already know it. But the answer is simple, because God was there. And I know preachers like me tell you that God is everywhere, but sometimes the presence of God descends upon humanity. When Jesus was with us, his name was Emmanuel, God with us. When God walked in the cool of the garden with Adam and Eve, there were moments when he was there with them in a way he wasn't at other times. And right here, surely Moses knew what it was like to live in the presence of God. But now he was walking in the presence of God. And what I would like for you to do tonight is to notice this simple thing, that in the presence of God, all of us need to be humble. I cannot help but think about James 4 and verse 10. It says we're to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, and, and He will lift us up. I've been teaching my children about humility, and one of the things I've taught my oldest daughter and my son is that you can't tell people you're humble. That invalidates the whole thing. They have to be the ones who say, you're humble. God is the one who says, Moses, I've got a job for you. God is the one who sets him apart. God is the one who descended in that moment and made that place holy. And God is the one who does that to us as well. For if in his presence we are humble, he will lift us up. Moses is about to be lifted up in a way very few people have ever been lifted before. The power of God is going to be behind him, is going to run through his message and, and his actions as he stands before the leader of the Egyptian world. And God is about to set him apart for a job that wasn't only Moses to do, but it was the one God picked for Moses to do. I'm grateful for that and I hope you are too. So know today, lesson number one, in the presence of God, we must be humble. We must take the shoes off our feet. We must take the shoes off our soul. We must bow in his presence because the wonder of God should draw us in and the power of God should humble us. As we continue on with the story, please read with me. Let's start there in verse 7. The Lord said to Moses, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of the taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land that flows with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Second lesson that I really want you to see tonight from this story is that God's not a negligent father. Nor is he an uninterested observer God is actively involved in the life of his people, if we realize it or not, and he is aware of what's going on, if he tells us or not. Just today I had a conversation with someone, and we were discussing at lunch how sometimes people are very lonely. The pandemic has certainly exacerbated that for a lot of people now that we're quarantining and we are socially distancing. Life sometimes can feel very, very lonely. 
And I believe that in Egypt, the Israelites felt alone. For 400 years, they felt alone. Maybe some of them felt God had abandoned them there. Maybe some wondered, when will God keep his word? And when will his promises finally come true? God never forgot the promise and never overlooked the people, even those who died in captivity. But he was waiting for the right time, for the time when the cry could go unanswered no more, for the time when Egypt could boast proudly no longer, for the time of Moses and Joshua, of Aaron and of Pharaoh's failure. What I love about God saying, I have heard, means that God still hears today. There is a continuation in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation that still exists now today, some 2,000 years later, that God has always heard the cries of His children. He's always listened to our prayers that sometimes don't even know what to say, and that He's never abandoned us in this world. He hasn't always come to save us from danger here. And he always won't. But he's never stopped caring. There have probably been Moses, or at least people like Moses, in your life and you didn't even realize it. People who served the very same purpose he did for generation after generation after generation of Israelites. I pray that maybe one day we can be a Moses for someone as we lead them out of the captivity of sin, or doubt and despair, or, or maybe even just this pandemic. Moses was simply a man whom God used. God was the one who delivered Israel. We're going to see that as we dig into the account of the plagues and what happened. But it wasn't Moses' power. It wasn't Pharaoh's stubbornness. It was God's might and will that delivered his people because he knew what they had suffered. He knew what they needed. And God always pays attention. You are never far from His sight. Your life is never hidden from Him. And even when you're just a shepherd in the wilderness who left Egypt behind, God knows what's going on in Egypt. And He knows that He needs you because you're going to help deliver His will, His message, and free His people. Let's keep reading on. I hope you still have your Bible. Exodus chapter 3. Let's start in verse 11. It says there that Moses, when he responded to God, said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial or my title to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done in Egypt, and have said I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Havites and the Jebusites to a land flowing with milk and honey. Then they will heed your voice, and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt. You shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, now let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to him. Reading these verses, I cannot help but think that there is so much power in a name that we miss it because we use it every day. My name is Neil Mathis, and that means something. My first and middle name is Raymond Neal. I was named after my grandfather. And I value so very much the fact that he is a good man that he has been and continues to be. I am grateful that he raised a family faithfully that still to this day honors God. 
I am grateful that my last name is Mathis, the name of my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather. And that I carry that name into the future. That I gave that name to my son, Max, and to my daughters, Molly and Maggie. That that's the name they wear, and we wear it so proudly. And even though it may not mean anything to you, it means everything to me. We're going to see later in Exodus that when Moses stands before Pharaoh, and he says, The Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of my fathers, has declared, let his people go. And Pharaoh says, I don't know him. Does that make God any less powerful or any less real? You might not know me or my grandfathers, my father who gave me my name, but, but you know me. And my name means something because it's theirs and now it's mine. It meant something yesterday. It means something today, and it will mean something tomorrow. The power of a name is so wonderfully demonstrated in God simply saying, My name is I Am. For I was, I am, and I will be. John 8 and verse 58, Jesus connects himself to that when he says, Before Abraham was, I am. It's simple and it's easy. There's no explanation necessary. God simply is. And when he proudly proclaimed his name, he knew that's what people will know me by. They've known me by that, and they will continue to know me. It is my title, my memorial for generation after generation, and I still serve today the great I Am. If you're a Christian, you do too. The same one who spoke to Moses is the one who hears my prayers. The same one who knew cries of the Egyptians is the one who hears my cries. And the same one who gave Moses a task to do is the one who puts a task in front of me. I cannot help but wonder what Moses must have been thinking through the whole ordeal. We you know at times he was un unsure of himself. They didn't believe he would be the one. That he was probably shocked that God picked him and he felt very unqualified. But here's the real parting lesson I want you to have today. You know what the burning bush teaches us? It doesn't just teach us that God is real. It doesn't just teach us that God listens. It doesn't just teach us that God is and will be. It teaches us that we have purpose. I wonder what my burning bush moment will be. Maybe I've already experienced it. And maybe being a minister is the exodus God put me on. Maybe when I was in college studying the Bible, studying at an advanced level the thoughts of Scripture and how it connects together so that I, I could be a minister and, and, and teach you tonight. Maybe that was my burning bush moment when God was speaking to me and saying, Neil, I've got something for you. Maybe there's still a moment waiting. All I know is that God has a purpose for all of us. And every day I look for that purpose. I believe tonight that purpose is to teach this lesson. And I believe tomorrow that purpose may be to do something similar. But I'll continue to look. Because I believe that God still speaks. And I believe that when God speaks, we should listen. And that when God sends us, we should go. And I believe that he still does that every single day. The call of the wild is the call into God's presence into the place where it's just you and him. And you leave behind everything else to be faithfully his. Moses ran from Egypt. And then he ran right back. Because God said, that's where I need you. So where does he need you tonight? Are you listening? He's probably shown you. Have you gone? Or did you make an excuse not to? The great I am still uses us to go places so that his will may be seen and to do things so that his message may be heard and to be things, to be his, so that the world may know that when he spoke, we listened. Next week, we'll talk about the first few moments in Egypt, the moments that precipitate and help set the stage 
for the ten plagues and all that unfolds. So thank you very much for watching tonight. My name is Neil Mathis. I'm the minister at the Tompkinsville Church of Christ, and I'm always grateful to spend this time with you. I pray that today has been a wonderful day and that this lesson has been a blessing. If you have questions, come to our website, www.tompkinsvillecoc.com. You might find answers. Come worship with us every Sunday at 10 a.m. Or just give us a call, 487-8366. We're always here to study, to learn, and to grow closer together with one another as we grow closer to God. Thank you tonight for being a part of this. Bye, my friend.